Well, in his sharply effective State of the Union address last week, President Biden included the best tax policy speech ever given by a Democrat. Folks at home, does anybody really think the tax code is fair? No. Do you really think the wealthy and big corporations need another $2 trillion tax break? No. I sure don't. I'm going to keep fighting like hell to make it fair. President Biden has been using some of the best lines, most effective lines from his State of the Union address on the campaign trail beginning the day after the State of the Union. Here's how he began his appeal on taxes today in New Hampshire. Does anybody here think the tax code is fair? Raise your hand. Well, I don't think so either. Republicans oppose everything that Joe Biden is proposing on taxes, everything. And so the Biden proposals for a tax code that is more fair depend entirely on our first guest tonight, becoming the next Speaker of the House in January. And that depends on you, the voters, electing a majority of Democrats to the House of Representatives. The Democratic leader of the House of Representatives, Hakeem Jeffries, needs only four more seats of Democrats in the House of Representatives to elect him Speaker of the House. He will be the first Speaker of the House from New York City, which is kind of remarkable that there's never been a speaker from New York City. And of course, he will be the first black speaker of the House. The United States Constitution has exactly one parliamentary rule for legislation. Quote, all bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives. That means all tax bills have to begin in the House. It will be up to Speaker Jeffries to guide the Biden tax fairness bill through the House of Representatives, which includes affordable increases in taxes only for people making over $400,000 a year and additional tax increases for billionaires, as well as increases in corporate taxation that still leaves the corporate tax rate lower than it was during the Clinton presidency when the economy was thriving. And while he's at it, Speaker Jeffries will have to guide all of the rest of the Biden legislative agenda through the House of Representatives. But if Hakeem Jeffries is not Speaker of the House next year, then a Republican Speaker will continue to either operate a do-nothing Congress or try to impeach members of the administration or try to take away from the people who Joe, who take things away from the people who Joe Biden's new budget released today would protect. Many of my Republican friends want to put Social Security and Medicare back on the chalking block, block again. If anyone tries to cut Social Security and Medicare or raise retirement age again, I will stop them. <laughs> Even this morning, Donald Trump said cuts to Social Security and Medicare are on the table again. But the bottom line is he's still at it. I'm never going to allow that to happen. I won't cut Social Security. I won't cut Medicare. And here's what Donald Trump said on CNBC today about cutting Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. So, first of all, there is a lot you can do in terms of entitlements, in terms of cutting. And, of course, later, the Trump campaign issued a statement claiming that Donald Trump was only talking about cutting waste in those programs. And I know everyone thinks there is race waste in all government programs, but no one has ever identified any waste in the Social Security program that can be cut or in Medicare. It's worth comparing Medicare to private health insurance. In private health insurance, 17% of the premiums that you pay for private health insurance are not used for health care. They are used purely for administrative costs, executive salaries, and in insurance companies, that also includes advertising costs, massive advertising costs. In Medicare, where the advertising costs are zero, the government-run health insurance program, everything the Republicans have always told you that would lead you to expect that the administrative costs of Medicare 
must be much, much higher than private insurance. And again, in private health insurance, the administrative costs, including advertising, are 17%. And in Medicare, the administrative costs are 2%. Two. Making Medicare simply the most efficient health insurance program in the world. Donald Trump is lying about cutting waste from Medicare. And the proof that he is lying about that is that in his four years in the presidency, he never once attempted to cut any waste from Medicare because his people couldn't find any. And he never attempted to cut any waste from Social Security because his people could not find any. Nor did he try to cut any waste from Medicaid. What Donald Trump said about cutting those programs today was very, very clear. But of course, Donald Trump's presidential campaign knows that it was a very stupid thing to say politically, and so the campaign is now trying to pretend that Donald Trump meant something else. But Donald Trump has said stupider things. In a new book by Jim Shudo, Donald, Trump, Donald Trump's third White House chief of staff, John Kelly, tells this story about Donald Trump, quote, he said, well, but Hitler did some good things. I said, well, what? And he said, well, Hitler rebuilt the economy. And I said, sir, you can never say anything good about the guy. Nothing, Kelly recounted. Trump also expressed admiration for Hitler's hold on senior Nazi officers. He would ask about the loyalty issues and about how, when I pointed out to him, the German generals as a group were not loyal to him and, in fact, tried to assassinate him a few times and he didn't know that, Kelly recalled. After visiting with Donald Trump in Florida on Friday, Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban said that Trump, quote, will not give a penny in the Ukrainian-Russian war. That is why the war will end, because it is obvious that Ukraine cannot stand on its own feet. If the Americans don't give money and weapons along with the Europeans, then the war is over. The same thing was true of Britain when Hitler invaded all of Western Europe and after conquering France was determined to soon have Nazi troops marching into London the way they marched into Paris. And the only way the British survived, the only way, was with military supplies delivered to them by the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who Joe Biden quoted at the very beginning of his State of the Union address on Thursday, in a speech that President Roosevelt made explaining to the American people why we needed to help the British survive Hitler's attack. The Roosevelt speech that Joe Biden quoted was given a year before the United States was attacked by Japan and then actually entered World War II as a participant in the combat. If Donald Trump had been in the presidency in 1941, when the British needed help to survive, Hitler would have won. We know Donald Trump's father was a Hitler sympathizer. Donald Trump admires every current head of state in the world who exhibits Hitlerian tendencies like Kim Jong-un in North Korea and Vladimir Putin in Russia, and in his way, Viktor Orban in Hungary. The day after Donald Trump praised Viktor Orban, for his dictator-like behavior in Hungary. Joe Biden said this in Georgia. Here's a guy who's kicking off his general election campaign on the road up with Marjorie Taylor Greene. <laughs> it can tell you a lot about a person who he keeps company with. And yesterday, he was hosting at his club, Viktor Orban, <laughs> who says he doesn't think democracy works. Call him a fantastic leader. Seriously. He bragged about calling Xi Jinping a king. He called Putin, and he said, do whatever the hell you want to our allies. I'm not making these, I'm not making these quotes up. When he says he wants to be a dictator, I believe him. And leading off our discussion tonight, House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries. Uh, Mr. Leader, it's really an honor to have you join us tonight. Thank you very much. Great to be with you, Lawrence. So the, the, uh, President Biden released his budget uh, that looks like a very big job. 
for Speaker Hakeem Jeffries if you get enough Democrats uh, into the House next year. Uh, that, that Biden agenda becomes the Speaker Jeffries agenda. What, for you, are the most important things uh, that you believe would have to get done legislatively by the House of Representatives? Well, we look forward as Democrats to continuing to be supportive of President Biden and his forward-looking agenda. The budget uh, that was released today uh, would continue the effort to grow the economy from the middle out and the bottom up with a focus on working families and middle-class families and, of course, low-income families all across America. Uh, it's a budget that will continue the work to lower costs for everyday Americans. We've made progress in that area, particularly as it relates to driving down the high price of life-saving prescription drugs. And as President Biden mentioned during the State of the Union address, which was spectacular, uh, that work needs to continue. Uh, and we look forward to partnering on that. Uh, and as President Biden has indicated in the context of his budget, we need to protect and strengthen Social Security and Medicare, not try to eradicate it as we know it, which is clearly what Donald Trump and the extreme MAGA Republicans would like to do. Uh, could you share with us uh, for just a moment what it was like to be in the room for that State of the Union address? I know they're not all the same, uh, but that one was was really extraordinary in the way that the president made it interactive. There were so many lines uh, that he spontaneously came up with on the spot because of what he was getting, negative feedback uh, noises from the Republican side of the House. You know, it was a hostile work environment that President Biden uh, was dealing with in terms of delivering a State of the Union address with the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene and others who are completely out of control and behave in a manner unbecoming of a member of the United States Congress. But President Biden knew what he was dealing with. Uh, it was high stakes. It was intense. And it was also an electric environment. And his remarks were strong. They were serious. They were substantive. Uh, and they penetrated, and he kept it at a high level from the very beginning of his remarks, starting, as you indicated, Lawrence, uh, by referencing FDR and the dynamics in this country during the start of World War II, uh, and he stayed at a high level all the way through to the very end. I, I want to listen to more of what the, the president said about the billionaire's tax. Uh, this is in New Hampshire today. You know what their average tax rate is? 8.2 percent taxes. Anybody want to trade their, their tax rate? No, I'm serious. If we just charge them, I had a tax code that charged them 25 percent, not the highest rate, 25 percent. You know how much that would raise over the next 10 years? $400 billion. $40 billion a year. Imagine what we could do from cutting the deficit to providing for child care, to providing health care, to continue to provide our military with all they need. As you know, we've been in a cycle for decades now where Republican presidents come into office with Republican assistance in the Congress and they enact stunning tax cuts that dramatically increase the budget deficit, dramatically increase the national debt. And that's followed at some point by a Democratic administration and a Democratic president who feels the responsibility to rebuild fiscal sanity by increasing taxes. Uh, and in that cycle over the decades, I haven't heard a Democrat find the case, make the case uh, in speeches for the Democratic tax policy better than I heard Joe Biden uh, in the State of the Union address and now out on the campaign trail since then. Uh, as you know, as, as the Constitution requires, all tax legislation begins under your jurisdiction in the House of Representatives. The House has to go first. What, in what you're hearing about the Biden approach to taxes, is that possible with a Democratic majority in the House of Representatives? I certainly believe uh, so, and we support President Biden's vision uh, for making sure that we have a tax code that is centered on economic growth and growing the middle class and all those Americans who aspire to be part of it. And through things like the enhanced and improved child tax credit, 
uh, which was part of the American Rescue Plan, but then Republicans allowed it to lapse. Uh, we want to be able to restore it uh, in the most robust fashion because it was an incredible uh, tax cut for working families, for low-income families, and for middle-class families in terms of uh, returning money into their pockets that could be used for day-to-day -day expenses. It was a spectacular success. And when you juxtapose that uh, with the extreme MAGA Republican vision, when they had the ability uh, to address tax code issues, what was their response? The GOP tax scam, where 83% of the benefits went to the wealthiest 1% uh, and saddled our children and grandchildren with $2 trillion worth of debt unnecessarily in order to subsidize the lifestyles of the wealthy, the well-off, and the well-connected. So President Biden is leaning into this issue. I think it's a winning issue, but more importantly, it's the right issue for the American people in terms of tax fairness. As you know, uh, one of your uh, leading predecessors, uh, House Democratic House Speaker Tip O'Neill, used to say all politics is local, by which he meant uh, he had a massive majority of Democrats in the House of Representatives because they all ran on local issues, whether they were being elected in Alabama or Alaska or anywhere else. And he never tried to impose or suggest to them a national campaign message. Has that balance changed? Surely uh, House races do involve local issues, but is there a new balance uh, in which the House races that you're looking at this year also have a unifying national message? Well, we have a top-line lens in terms of how we are conducting ourselves here in Washington, D.C., that I think unifies the caucus from progressives to New Dems to Blue Dogs, all points in between, which is that we're going to continue to put people over politics and to focus on kitchen table, bread and butter issues like lowering costs, uh, better paying jobs, growing the middle class, and of course, keeping our communities safe. And we've said, Lawrence, from the very beginning that we will find bipartisan common ground with our Republican colleagues on any issue whenever and wherever possible in order to make life better for the American people. But at the same period of time, we'll push back against their extremism whenever necessary. And what we've seen is that they're extreme in every way possible, extreme on reproductive freedom. They want to criminalize abortion care, get rid of IVF, impose a nationwide ban. We believe in a woman's freedom to make her own reproductive health care decisions. We believe in Social Security and Medicare. We want to protect and strengthen it. They want to end Social Security and Medicare as we know it. That's extreme. We believe in democracy. President Trump, or former President Trump, has indicated he wants to be a dictator on day one. Uh, and so they, by their extremism, have in some ways nationalized the stakes because they are so out of control. We're going to continue to put people over politics. Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, now one election away from being Speaker Jeffries. Thank you very, very much for starting off our discussions tonight. Thanks, Lawrence. Thank you. And coming up, America's most desperate criminal defendant tried another desperate move today in an attempt to hush up porn star Stormy Daniels once again. That's next. Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyers threw a Hail Mary pass today trying to stop the criminal trial set to begin two weeks from now in Manhattan, where Donald Trump stands accused of business fraud in hush money payments that he made to the porn star Stormy Daniels to purchase her silence about an evening they spent together, according to Stormy Daniels, having Donald Trump's version of sex in a hotel room weeks after Donald Trump's third wife gave birth to his last child. The phrase Hail Mary play or Hail Mary pass was born in October of 1922 during a Notre Dame football game against Georgia Tech. Notre Dame won the game 13 to three. And before each of the two plays that Notre Dame ran for touchdowns, the Notre Dame players stopped and as a group said the Catholic prayer, Hail Mary. It is unlikely that Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyers and Donald Trump know the words 
of the Hail Mary. In fact, there's no evidence that Donald Trump knows who Mary was. But he does know who Stormy Daniels is, and he is now trying to get out of a criminal trial about his payoff scheme, claiming that the Supreme Court's consideration of Donald Trump's legal claim that he and all presidents are immune from prosecution for any crimes they may commit during a presidency should delay the hush money trial until after the Supreme Court has decided that issue. Joining our discussion now is Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel and former chief of the criminal division in the Eastern District of New York. He is the co-host of the MSNBC podcast, Prosecuting Donald Trump, and co-author of the new best-selling book, The Trump Indictments, the historic charging documents with commentary. Also with us, Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney and professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. She is the co-host of the podcast, Sisters in Law. They're both MSNBC legal analysts. And Andrew, uh, Judge uh, Mershon has given uh, the prosecution until Wednesday uh, of this week to respond to Donald Trump's request to delay, to block the trial about the hush money payments to Stormy Daniels. Uh, what are you anticipating in, as a result of this? A denial. Um, there's no question that Judge Marchand is going to reject this. The only question is whether it can be used by Donald Trump on appeal to somehow stay the trial. It's worth noting that this motion is way out of time, meaning the schedule is one that uh, did not permit this. The judge, out of courtesy, has said that he would accept it. Uh, and there's no question he will deny it. Two quick points on one sort of big picture, one substance. On the big picture, this is not the action of somebody who thinks that he's innocent and wants his day in court. He is doing, in this case, as, as he's doing around the country, seeking to avoid his day in court while prosecutors are seeking their day in court. Um, so um, that sort of big picture, small picture is the reason this is so frivolous amongst many, many reasons is the charges here are not related to anything that he did as president of the United States. That's the, so when you look at immunity, you look at whether the charges relate to something that he was that was done as president. That's that's to get even into into the ballpark of saying that they they could possibly be immune. He's conflating the idea of charges with evidence that comes from tweets or statements he made at, while he was president. But that's an evidentiary issue, whether statements he made are relevant to proving up those charges. Pr any claim of presidential immunity doesn't go to that evidentiary claim. It would only go to the charges. And as I mentioned, they are simply not anything related to his official acts. To state the obvious, paying hush money to a porn star is not a presidential act. Wow. Uh, you know, Andrew, sometimes your law school class is easier than other nights. Uh, that put, that <laughs> last line, I think, is very clear to most of our students tonight. Uh, so, uh, Joyce, the, um, the deadline for filing motions like this uh, was February 22nd. But the Supreme Court did not agree to hear the immunity uh, claim until February 27th. That's an immunity claim based on another case. So their argument would be, look, we didn't know on February 22nd at the deadline that the Supreme Court would be hearing this. Uh, this is important information. And so the deadline should be flexible for something like that. And that's why the judge is being generous, Lawrence. But Andrew is dead on target when he says that this is a frivolous motion. I think characterizing it as a Hail Mary is far too generous because it really is just sort of crazy town. The argument isn't even that Trump is entitled to immunity here. He actually waived that argument last summer when he made it um, in a proceeding related to his efforts to remove this case from state court to federal court. And the federal judge in that case said absolutely no presidential immunity. Trump uh, initially appealed that, and then he dismissed the appeal. So he can't raise the substantive argument, but he's desperate to get the benefit 
of the Supreme Court taking up this case. So he's made this bizarre, convoluted argument that presidential immunity bars evidence in essence of any acts he took as president. It is, I think, over the edge on, on frivolity, and courts are entitled to sanction litigants who bring frivolous motions. Uh, Andrew, how long would it take, in your estimation, for Judge Mershon to deal with this? How many days will this take? I'm not to be snarky, but I'm not sure days is the correct <laughs> term here. I mean, just, I mean, you're, the reason you're hearing both Joyce and me, and Joyce, remember, is an appellate lawyer at heart, so you can really take what she says more than what I say to the bank, but the reason you're hearing such dismissiveness is this is, for lawyers, you don't read this and think that this is grounded in anything. Um, it's it's so frivolous. So I, I just would be very surprised if there isn't re truly an imminent ruling. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that Donald Trump will not try to get uh, to take it up on appeal, but to, to do something like that, he needs to get a stay. And it's really, I know everyone's thinking that courts can be um, very fickle. It's very hard to imagine in this circumstance that anyone would give a stay here and think that there's any sort of likelihood of success on the merits. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we need both of you to stay with us because when we come back, uh, Donald Trump, it turns out, cannot stop talking about E. Jean Carroll, even though that has already cost him almost $100 million. That's next. Giant insurance companies that do a lot more than just car insurance usually have the most abstract advertising on TV. You can watch this ad on TV for most of its 30 seconds and have no idea what it could possibly be about. Until you come to the voiceover punchline at the very end where the strong, manly voice simply says, Chubb for those who want to do more. Today, Chubb Insurance did a lot more for a criminal defendant whose entire business is under threat from a civil judgment against that business in New York for almost half a billion dollars. A division of the Chubb Insurance Company has decided to, in effect, ensure the payment of Donald Trump's $91 million judgment against him in the case won by E. Jean Carroll in which she proved to a jury that Donald Trump raped her. It might just be a coincidence that the CEO of Chubb, Evan Greenberg, held an obscure position in the Trump administration. And on the day when Chubb made this very strange bet that no doubt will not appear in its TV advertising, Donald Trump proved to the shareholders of Trump what a terrible idea it is to support Donald Trump's appeal of the defamation verdict that E. Jean Carroll won. Because today, Donald Trump appears to have defamed, lied about E. Jean Carroll once again. A person I never, I never met, I have no idea who she is, except one thing, I got sued. From that point on, I said, wow, that's crazy what this is. I got charged. I was given a false accusation and had to post a $91 million bond on a false accusation. Chubb had fair warning that Donald Trump was going to take another $91 million risk in lying about E. Jean Carroll today because he also lied about her on Saturday. $91 million. Based on false accusations made about me by a woman that I knew nothing about, didn't know, never heard of, I know nothing about her. Still with us, Andrew Weissman and Joyce Vance. Uh, Joyce, uh, he's doing it again. Uh, what's, what happens next here? 
You know, Trump is treating like this, uh, this like he has now got a license to continue to defame E. Jean Carroll endlessly. At some point, I suspect her lawyers will step in. There may be another lawsuit. You know, Lawrence, Trump may think that the sticking point is that she's already suffered damages. She couldn't prove damages that she would have to prove in a third defamation case. But I think that there's a good argument here that the impact of this ongoing defamation, even after the first two lawsuits, uniquely damages Carol. And she has smart lawyers who are more than capable of crafting a theory. E. Jean Carroll has held Trump accountable in ways no one else has. I don't think she's about to give up that ground just because he can't be stopped by these judgments. Uh, Andrew Weissman, you have to wonder, in the history of the Chubb Insurance Company, how many criminal defendants facing four separate criminal indictments in four separate jurisdictions who are also suffering under the burdens of massive civil judgments against them, how many of those people have been supported by the Chubb Insurance Company in a situation like this, where the Chubb Insurance Company is, in effect, ensuring, guaranteeing that Donald Trump, or they, Chubb, will pay the E. Jean Carroll verdict uh, if E. Jean Carroll wins on appeal. It seems like something the Chubb Insurance Company has probably never done in its history. Yeah, and and there's a reputational hit. There is from from what they've done. There is the concern that they essentially, as Joyce has pointed out, given him license, uh, and he feels now more leeway to continue the ongoing attacks. Uh, and so I think there is an unwritten story to why they are doing what they're doing. Um, what were the negotiations? Were there quid pro quos? Were there promises? Were there third parties who were guaranteeing uh, and co-signing a bond? What was it that led them to do this? Um, there's something about facially this not seeming plausible. Uh, there's a concern about, did he really have the assets free and clear that weren't already pledged to other loans uh, to put up that would give Chubb enough security, given all of the downsides? Um, but this ongoing nature of the attacks tells you who he is. And just to be, to, since you very often quote from history, this to me is at long last, have you left no sense of decency, mm -hmm. that there's really, that it tells you everything about the metal of the man in terms of what we're seeing for somebody who has committed as a jury found sexual assault and repeated defamation to continue doing this. Andrew Weissman, Joyce Batts, thank you both very much for joining us tonight. Welcome. Thanks, Lawrence. And coming up, Joe Biden has a huge campaign cash advantage over Donald Trump, who has been burning up campaign cash, paying criminal defense lawyers. And now the Biden-Harris campaign is off to a big head start in TV advertising in the battleground states. This could help other Democrats up for re-election in those states this year, including Joe Biden's friend, Bob Casey, who's running for re-election to the Senate in Pennsylvania. Joe Biden likes to publicly show off his friendship with Bob Casey by calling him Bobby. I will be calling him Senator. That's next. The Biden-Harris presidential campaign has launched a $30 million TV ad campaign. Look, I'm not a young guy. That's no secret. But here's the deal. I understand how to get things done for the American people. I led the country through the COVID crisis. Today, we have the strongest economy in the world. I passed a law that lowers prescription drug prices, caps insulin at $35 a month for seniors. For four years, Donald Trump tried to pass an infrastructure law, and he failed. I got it done. Now we're rebuilding America. I passed the biggest law in history to combat climate change because our future depends on it. Donald Trump took away the freedom of women to choose. I'm determined to make Roe v. Wade the law of the land again. 
Donald Trump believes the job of the president is to take care of Donald Trump. I believe the job of the president is to fight for you, the American people, and that's what I'm doing. The campaign has also announced a month of action where President Biden and Vice President Harris will visit every battleground state by the end of March. To kick off the tour, President Biden made his fourth visit this year on Friday to Pennsylvania, a state that he won in 2020 by 80,555 votes. While in Pennsylvania, President Biden reiterated his call for Congress to pass Pennsylvania Senator Bob Casey's legislation that would penalize corporations for selling smaller amounts of their products while not lowering the price. Too many corporations raise their prices and pad their profits, charging you more and more for less and less. That's why we're cracking down on corporations engaged in price gouging and deceptive pricing. Looks like companies that, uh, that you wouldn't notice, they thought you wouldn't notice, but, you know, if you're a, they give you the same size bag of potato chips with about 20% fewer potato chips. No, by the way, that's not a joke. Some of you may have seen there was a, a TV thing on how Snickers bars, same exact price with, uh, some, don't hold me the exact number, but like 20% less bar. No, I'm serious. Congress needs to sign Bobby Casey's bill to stop shrinkflation. Stop it. Joining us now is Democratic Senator Bob Casey of Pennsylvania, the longest-serving Democratic senator in Pennsylvania. He is running for the United States Senate re-election this year. Uh, senator Casey, uh, to some voters, it's going to sound like too small an issue for a president or for a senator to be concerned about how many potato chips there are in the bag. What's at stake? Well, Lawrence, I think what's at stake is for, for so many years now, these companies have been shrinking their product but not shrinking the price. So that's that's the basic uh, ripoff that we're talking about here. That's why I have legislation to deal with it. But I think in a larger sense, it's about a much, much greater problem, which is greedflation, which is uh, big corporations jacking up their prices, the cost of food, the, the price of household items, and and raising those prices way above their costs. You know, corporate profits in the in the two years between July of 20 to July of 22, corporate profits were up 75 percent, five times the rate of inflation. That's a ripoff on a, on a grander scale. That's greedflation. And what we need to, to remedy that is to pass legislation so, so that the Federal Trade Commission can investigate price gouging. And that's another bill that I have that the, the president and others I know are trying to pass with us. So we've got to crack down on these big corporations, whether they're engaged in shrinkflation or greedflation, because it's ripping people off, and it's about time we took action against it. So you're going to see those Biden campaign ads because Pennsylvania is a battleground state. They'll be running on Philadelphia TV. They'll be running on Pittsburgh TV. Not going to see them in Los Angeles. You're not going to see them in New York because they're not battleground markets where those ads are, are running. Uh, do those, does, the, does, does the enthusiasm that those ads try to build for the Biden-Harris ticket help candidates like you running for Senate in those same states? No question, Lawrence, because on every one of the issues that the president's ad touched on, uh, I'm on his side on, when it comes to voting for the legislation to reduce the, the cost of insulin, the, the capping it at 35 bucks a month for Medicare Part D beneficiaries. I voted for the infrastructure bill, um, voted to, to make sure that we can we can invest in infrastructure in a state like ours. And on all these issues, my opponent in the race, uh, the Republican candidate who just endorsed Donald Trump last week, he's on the other side. He wants to repeal the infrastructure bill, repeal the legislation that gave Medicare the power to negotiate lower prescription drug costs, and, and also enshrined in the law that cap on insulin. So on every one of these issues, I'm on one side, he's on the other. So these issues... I think are, are front and center for, for voters. And I would hope that voters out there following my race and following the presidential race, if they're with us on these issues, I hope they go to bobcasey.com. So uh, you're running against a pretty rich Republican uh, who has promised, uh, reading the Philadelphia Inquirer, 
to do a bus tour of every all of 67 counties in the state. And on Saturday, he promised, he said, to live on the bus until November. And the Philadelphia Inquirer reports that very night, he flew back home to Connecticut, uh, apparently on a private jet. Uh, it, it, do you are you just getting lucky with these kinds of opponents who can do things like this? Well, Lawrence, it's rather bizarre when someone says when he be, when he uh, arrived in Pennsylvania to run for public office, he he had he had grown up in the state and then he came back decades later. And when he arrived in Pennsylvania to be a candidate in 2022 to run for the Senate in a primary, he kept telling people, I live in Pennsylvania. And then he kept telling them that in 2023 when he was leading up to this race. So he lied to the people of our state about where he lives. The Associated Press caught him in that lie. They wrote a story about it in August of 23. And I think people should know that, and more and more people do know it. And when it comes to this current uh, iteration of the campaign, when you say you're going to have a bus tour and you're going to spend all this time in Pennsylvania, you shouldn't be flying back and forth to your home in Connecticut. But it gets... It gets, ba it gets down to a basic question, I think, of integrity. And I think when people elect a United States senator, they want to know that that's, that senator is someone who's rooted in the state, who understands the challenges that families face, trying to, tr trying to pay for those higher costs that I mentioned earlier. And I think that, that he's had real trouble connecting because people don't have, get a sense that, he's, uh, that he understands the struggles that they're up against. He's being financed by these big billionaires that are that have already raised $18 million for a super PAC. Senator Bob Casey, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We're going to need your guidance on the battleground state of Pennsylvania throughout the year. Thank you very much, Senator. Thanks, Lawrence. Thank we'll be right back. Senator Bob Casey gets tonight's last word.